Thanks so much for joining Junction Reads and Alicia Elliott. I'm so excited to um, have you all join us. I'm excited to have you, Alicia. Thank you so much for coming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I have a, a lot of questions uh, uh, born out of a conversation Alicia and I had. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, talk about writing and uh, the process. Uh, Mind Spread Out on the Ground is Alicia's nonfiction collection, uh, but today we're going to get a treat and Alicia's actually going to read from her novel, which is uh, the work in progress. <laughs> and, and so uh, that's going to be the, the focus of our conversation today. Feel free to ask questions about Mind Spread Out on the Ground or um, the extract from the novel that Alicia is going to share, um, but uh, there you go. And for the viewing enjoyment, if you wanna to go to the top right corner of your screen, you can change it to speaker view and then you will get exactly what Kaylee, the event coordinator shows on the screen and you won't have to see a bunch of other people. Not that you're not all beautiful. Um, so before we get started, I'm gonna start with the, an acknowledgement of land. I also recognize that there are people from across Turtle Island. So if you would like to share your own acknowledgement, you can uh, share it in the chat or send it to Kaylee and she can share it on your behalf. Uh, but I am in Toronto, so I will say, we will start with an acknowledgement of land. I am sitting in Tecoronto for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Wendat, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. Thank you so much, Alicia. I'm gonna turn it over to you with <laughs> my favorite question to ask writers, uh, because I always get to steal uh, great ideas from them. What are you reading right now? Um, actually, I'm reading, well, I'm reading a few books, but I feel like the ones that are just like at the top of my mind are um, uh, The Centaur's Wife by Amanda LaDuc, which just came out. It's brand new. Um, it's kind of this post-apocalyptic fantasy book that has to do with centaurs, which is like so different. I just feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so used to um, I don't know, well, not really fantasy, but kind of like vampires and all those, that kind of stuff. So like centaurs is just so different and interesting. Um, uh, so anyways, I'm only about, I want to say 80 pages in, but it's really good so far. Um, uh, Amanda's an amazing writer. Um, and, you know, uh, I love too that, you know, she has a, a, a female lead that's really interesting and also she has a disability but it's not like you know the biggest thing about the book you know what I mean if that makes sense yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh the other book I just got was um Return of the Trickster by Eden Robinson and I wanna like I, I started reading it but then I was like I have to wait until I finish the other books because I, I just want to be able to like go totally in um because it's the last book in the trilogy and um I just like relish everything Eden Robinson writes so <laughs> I want to be able to just kind of like sit with it and and only do that for a weekend or something yeah ignore the rest of the world I'm excited for both of those books um thanks for sharing Kaylee has shared some uh links if you uh, want to get more information about those two books you can and uh shop independent booksellers there are are lots uh between Brantford and Toronto I'm sure um, so before, and I'm so excited, I'm literally, I'm like sweating, <laughs> waiting to hear uh, an extract from this novel, but before we uh, uh, hear from you, I'm going to share your biography, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Alicia Elliott is a Mohawk writer from Six Nations of the Grand River. She is the author of a collection of essays, Mind Spread Out on the Ground, from Penguin Random House Canada. Her writing has also appeared in Room, Grain, The New Quarterly, The Malahat Review, The Globe and Mail, Maclean's, and many more. The title essay for Mind Spread Out on the Ground won a National Magazine Award, and Alicia was selected by Tanya Talaga to receive the RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award. She lives in Brantford, Ontario, where she is working on this novel. Alicia. Yeah. <laughs> 
why? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> kind of, I don't know, just very, um, I mean, I feel like it's not smart maybe for people <laughs> to share like this early of drafts, but I, um, I don't know. I just kind of feel like it, it's good for being able to talk about the writing process, being able to talk about kind of like, you know, how I guess I moved into fiction again after like a long foray in nonfiction. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> so, um, there is like a, technically a preface to the to the novel, but I'm not gonna read from that. I'm just gonna read from chapter one because um, the preface will take too long to read. <laughs> so, and this I feel like is a good little like chunk. Um, so chapter one, the beginning. There never was a beginning. So let's get that out of the way now. There was a before and before that was another before and another before before that. I know that's probably confusing to a modern mind like yours. Colonialism, colonialism and so-called linear time have ruined us. We can't even wrap our heads around our own stories because we've been trained to think in good straight Christian lines. But the world doesn't work like that. It never has. Anyway, before before, the world was covered in water. A deep ocean that held creatures like pearls. An endless sky that bore witness to the brilliance of the birds. Now, when I say sky, some outer space is included in there too. A lot of outer space actually. Pretty much anything that can be seen from Earth counts as sky, but that's not to be confused with sky world, which is even higher than the sky. It's its own world with its own problems. So I guess when you really stop and think about it, it's not that different from our world or our problems, so it might as well just be the plain old world. And there I go, getting ahead of myself again. Sorry, bad storyteller. Let me ask you a quick question. When I say that, bad storyteller, you imagine a white lady with a straight line of a mouth wagging her finger in your face too? Bad storyteller, wag. Bad Indian, wag, wag. Bad woman, bad human, bad subhuman, bad unreal, unholy object, bad possession, my possession, his possession, everyone's possession, but your own bad, 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 bad. Wag, 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 wag. No, just me. I'll remember that for later. So basically the order went from top down, sky world, sky, ocean. At the very, very bottom of the ocean, the animals heard, there was something called land. They weren't sure, mind you, but they most definitely suspected. Heard from a friend's sister's boyfriend's cousin and they all but confirmed it. The animals have always been a gossipy bunch. Of course, no one had ever seen this land or felt this land or taken grainy, possibly doctored pictures of this land to pass around and praise or debunk. So most of the animals just laughed the whole thing off. Everyone knew there was only sea and sky. Sink or swim or fly, I guess. I like how the animals are conspiracy theorists. Steve is standing over my shoulder, breathing his criticism onto my neck. I don't know how he snuck up on me. Usually I can smell his cologne from at least 10 feet away. He thinks because he spent more than $10 on it that it must smell really good. It doesn't. It smells like an unwashed for a couple days douchebag. Plus, I'm pretty sure I'm allergic to it because my nose starts to run whenever he sprays, delays, and walks away. Learned that from Queer Eye, he told me once, smiling with characteristic earnestness. Still, I suffer the smell and the snot with a smile, like a good little wife. Thanks, babe, I say, turning to peck Steve's already puckered and waiting lips. That's sweet of you to say, but it's not good. And it's definitely not ready to be read yet. I slam my laptop shut and stand up quick. Oh, sorry. Didn't realize you were keeping it secret. Steve moves up and away from me, hurt, and my once uncomfortably warm neck becomes suddenly cold. I feel a pang of shame, 
so deep and sudden and fleeting, I can't possibly follow it back to its roots, quickly swallowed up by regret. I'm doing it again, turning Steve into a villain. He only wants to read my writing because he's excited. He wants to encourage me. He wants me to succeed. He's told me as much, said he wants us to set goals for ourselves as individuals and as a family so we can maintain our autonomy. I'm doing that, exactly what he wants me to do. And he's happy for me, wants to celebrate me with me. He doesn't deserve this. And take a few long strides away from him, busy myself folding and refolding bright white bibs as I consider the best way to slowly, apologetically invite him back in again. I'm worried about the tone, I finally say, turning my head to look at him, hoping my face looks soft and feminine instead of hard and masculine. It takes conscious effort for me to do that, look helpless, vulnerable, innocent, in a way I'm sure would be absurd to so many white women. Maybe it's too flippant, I add for emphasis. She smiles, or Steve smiles, very slightly, almost imperceptibly. I like the tone, he says, his voice tentative, like that kid at every public school who just has to dip their big toe in the water to test the temperature before they let themselves jump in. It's ballsy, he continues, totally different from the old sage Indian everyone thinks of whenever anybody says the word creation story. Not everyone thinks of that, I want to say. White people think of that. Suddenly, Steve's behind me again. I feel the warm of his body. He's so confident, always. Just yesterday, I was standing in the kitchen in the same kiss pajamas I've been wearing for a week, staring at the terracotta colored walls and realizing for the first time how much I hated them. Steve had chosen the paint. Steve had chosen everything. He'd asked for my input when we first moved in, but I'd shrugged, said I wasn't adult enough to care about paint swatches and custom caps. How my entire house looks like it was ripped from an Ikea catalog all clean lines and no character. White cupboards and chrome pendant lamps and black cube couches. I'm scared to move inside it, scared to dirty it, to disrupt its sanitary perfection. My stylish yet affordable Swedish designed prison. Something's burning. Steve was suddenly in the kitchen beside me, motioning towards the stove. My eyes followed the line of his arm down to the finger. Dark smoke bubbled over the top of the oven door like steam from a lifted pot lid, then floated up towards the ceiling. Smoke. Holy shit, I thought. Is something on fire? Of course something was on fire. The evidence was all there. The sharp smell of smoke. The shrill scream of the smoke alarm. For a moment, I wondered if I was dreaming again, but the inside of my cheek focused on the pain, the sharpness, reminded me to trust that pain, the truth of it. This was real. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. But it was too late. Steve had already grabbed oven mitts, opened the oven door, snatched the baking sheet, slammed the door shut, and dropped the baking sheet into the sink with a clatter. I still hadn't moved. Who knows how long I would have stood there, eyes wide as the smoke took over. I don't know what happened. I must have zoned out or something. I watched as he turned on the taps, then watched as a steady stream of water rushed over the charred remains of two hungry man dinners. I wanted to have dinner waiting. It's okay, honey, really. I don't expect you to be some sort of Stepford wife. You're caring for our baby. I wanted to make you food, I say weakly, then wipe at my eyes, watering from the smoke or the shame. I can order some delivery, set it out on plates all nice like I cooked it. Sounds great. He bent in and kissed me on the cheek like a dog pissing on a tree. When the delivery got there and I set it all out, Steve fully committed to the scene. Thank you so much for making this, babe, Steve said. You know how much I love burgers. As though there were nothing he wanted more in the entire world than to sit down to delivery McDonald's and consume 2,000 unnecessary calories. After that, he launched into the minutiae minutia of his day. He knows we're trying to save money and he was going to eat the tuna sandwich he packed, but the head of the department invited him out and he really did have to keep his eye on tenure. He went, about his, um, he went on about his colleagues as if they were our nearest, dearest friends, 
and I had some personal investment in the progress of Christine's home reno or Lou's kids graduation from kindergarten. Who cares about any of these things? Am I supposed to care now that I'm married to Steve? Or is pretending enough? Who knows? Maybe none of these people, not bland Christine, not even clingy weird Lou, really care about any of the bullshit they blather on about to social climbing coworkers like Steve. They certainly don't care if I know the minutia of their mundane lives. I'm the unemployed, uneducated native slut that stole their precious coworker from them, nullifying months of planned blind dates with their desperate single friends. They don't see me as having a full enough inner life to even be capable of cr criticizing them. They don't even find it necessary to remember my name. Steve, of course, insists none of his coworkers have a racist bone in their bodies, as if racism were something concrete they could, that could be isolated in a body and extracted instead of an interconnected system of experiences and beliefs that infiltrates and influences every interaction we have, whether we want it to or not. Curiously, Steve doesn't ask me how my day was. I'm wondering if that was strategic. Well, Steve, I might have said if I had any spine. I haven't changed in a week now. I smell like baby puke and sweat. Your daughter doesn't want the milk for my tits, so I'm always sore and she's always crying. And I still won't fuck you. You probably somehow hear those words as terms of endearment. He loves me that much. Me, the zombie of a woman he was fool enough to marry. When Steve finished his meal, he shouted, Nyaw, what? exaggerating the last syllable the way he always does because he knows it makes me laugh. Meow, I replied quietly, shoveling another burnt fry end into my mouth. Oh, guess what, he asked as he grabbed my now empty plate to sweep into the dishwasher. U of T is offering a beginner Mohawk class this year. I talked to the head of the department and they're gonna pay for me to enroll. I managed to convince him it'll benefit the department to have staff who actually speak Mohawk. Isn't that great? It was as if everything paused for a second. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. When the pause was over, my insides shook with fury. No, not just my insides, my outsides too. In my left hand was a silver fork. It came from a silverware set Steve's great uncle Bob had given us as a wedding gift. His wife had gone on and on about the proper way to polish it before we'd even opened their gift. I stared down at that quivering silver fork thinking about how beautiful and shiny it would be if not for my oily fingers. I focused on the smudges, the way they blurred at some edges but stayed sharp in others, and I willed myself to stop shaking like an idiot. What was happening to me? Why was I so mad? And why was I pushing myself to the background of my body again all of a sudden? And that hadn't happened in months, not since mom died. I sat at the white table and curled and uncurled my toes, trying to pull myself back into my skin as Steve told me about his new language teacher. I encouraged, I smiled, I did what I was supposed to. That was yesterday. Today was his first language class. He was there in some yellow tinged classroom reading handouts and forcing his hard English tongue to make soft Mohawk sounds. While I was here, pretending I know how to write Mohawk stories in English words. It's hard not to be jealous of him and embarrassed of myself. Still, Steve is all confidence. Just now, his hand is slowly working its way under the waistband of my sweatpants. I start to feel myself pull out of my body again. Don't worry about anyone else's opinion, Steve whispers. Only Songwan Diso can judge you. He laughs. I laugh. Songwan Diso. He slid the mohawk in so seamlessly, so confidently, the same way he's sliding his fingers into my waistband now. I let them move over me, over the top of my panties, and feel my consciousness slink into the background. This is the second time in two days I've disassociated. Take note, the way Ma always told me to, then try to ground myself back in the now again. I start by focusing on Steve, his dampening hands running all over my skin, his mouth on my neck kissing me. I never used to mind how sweaty his hands would get. In fact, I used to like it. I somehow convinced myself his hand sweat was evidence of his fragility, 
his anxiety, his need for me. Now his hands remind me of eels freshly yanked from the creek. I focus on them, feel the saliva well up in my mouth, the sour before the puke, and try not to gag. It works. I'm back in my body. Is that better? I do love Steve. I can tell by the way I always turn towards him whenever he's in a room, still, as if he's the sun and I'm a sunflower starving for his warmth. I structure every day around when he's home and when he's not, as though my very being would disappear into motherhood without him here to witness me. He's funny and kind and smart and looks at me sometimes like he's amazed I'm even real. I love that. But I can't help but notice he hasn't suffered at all since we've gotten married. If anything, he's excelled. Now that he's married with a baby, he can better relate to the older, more tenured faculty in his department. He can drag me along to dinner parties where I feel like an exhibit on display and dress up our daughter in cute baby drag so that strange white women are more enticed to scoop her out of her stroller without my permission. It might be a sacrifice for me, for our baby, but at least it'll help Steve achieve his goals. Every action we take is purposeful and imbued with meaning for him because it makes him more relatable, more feminist. It adds to his brand. Me though, I think about my life and I'm consumed by this inescapable feeling of waste. Every day is the same, same boredom, same humiliation, same loneliness, same helplessness. I look out at the young women who pass, who walk past the house and fantasize about where they're going, who they're gonna hang out with, what drugs they're gonna do when they get there, who they're gonna fuck when they start to come down and everything has lost its glitter. And then naturally, I start to think about myself and my boring ass fucked up existence. I look at every thread in my life from the most obvious to the most seemingly inconsequential and follow them back years, decades, trying to find the exact moment when I started to become this. It's hard to say. Every time I follow one thread, it tangles into others and I have to pick at it like a scab until it opens to me. At some point during the pregnancy, I can't quite remember when, I even began to imagine my life was a series of tests. Anytime I made a choice, I began to imagine I'd have to step onto a giant scale. If I made the right choice, everything would be fine and I could get off the scale and continue on. If I made the wrong choice though, I would fall through a trap door and fall and keep falling, maybe forever. For some reason, I can't shake this idea, not even after my cousin Melita pointed out it was pretty much plagiarized from the Baruch assault scene and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The stakes for every choice all seemed so high and I didn't want to choose. I couldn't. I wanted choices to be made for me. I wanted to be taken care of. I'd rather stare blankly at all my options as all my options blinkered out like dying Christmas lights than make one false move. Everything I might have been or might be doing dangling just out of reach while my insides turned to sand and fall grain by grain down the hourglass of my life. Steve doesn't notice. He wouldn't though. He's too blinded by the picture of us he's fixed in his mind. He and I and our daughter, Dawn, in the living room, logs simmering in the fireplace behind us, smoke eerily absent as we smile from behind above our matching sweaters arranged just so. The happy family, always staring at one another in blank adoration as if amazed that each person really truly exists. No shitty cologne, no stocking runs, no crying babies with their shit heavy diapers and pure strangling need. No wives with second thoughts waiting for their chance to retreat behind a door and disappear. Um, and that's where I will stop. <laughs> wow. That was amazing. That in such a short amount of time, I'm captivated by this character. Oh my gosh. So well done. I, I, uh, I'm going to, I want to ask you directly, but how does it feel reading that? And I'm going to, to preface it with the, the um, question that I, that you and I had talked about uh, based on the essay from Mind Spread Up, Spread Out on the Ground, Susan's, the Sontag uh, essay. 
And you ask in that essay, are, your, are our experiences made more real when they're witnessed? And when I read that, of course, I'm, I, I thought immediately about the idea of writing and art in general, it being um, art without an audience. Is it art just because it's being created by an artist or does it need to be witnessed? And so I wanna ask you that, what you think about answering the question from your essay in relation to fiction and your art and how you feel now having shared that extract from the novel. Uh, I think that when we get into questions of art and, and all of this, it all starts to get really muddy because um, I'm someone who very much, uh, you know, kind of believes that um, that the boundaries around art are um, often put in place by gatekeepers who want to differentiate between certain types of creation and um, and certain types of people deemed creators. So, you know, um, I immediately what comes to mind for me is, um, you know, the notion of um, what is art versus what's arts and crafts. You know what I mean? Um, this idea that things that are crafts are um, are not considered art. Or even then when you think about what's what's the difference between someone who's an amateur artist and a professional artist is that, you know, dependent, like to me, I feel like the idea of art today is so connected with commerce that it's hard to kind of separate um, art for, you know, art from, art product, you know, which uh, I think is um, something where, you know, if you write something and it expresses what you need to express and you are your, the only audience for it, does that necessarily have more value or less value than art that you are giving to, um, to be published for anyone to access it, you know? Um, and I think that that's really just a, a, a question that, you know, every person, it, it's relative to every, um, every person, every um, experience with art. I feel like, you know, we, in so many ways, we try to intellectualize um, our experiences of art and kind of try to, you know, be like, oh, well, you know, we can't enjoy um, someone doing a YouTube cover of a song as much as we enjoy someone who's who was in a studio with all of these professionals tinkering with things or whatnot. But um, as though, you know, that, that that's the proper way to, um, to share art, and that's the proper way to consume art. And, um, and that's the proper type of art that we should um, love and really hold close to us. And, you know, I, I think that more and more as I get older, I think that for me, um, the most valuable stuff that I come back to is the stuff that really strikes an emotional chord. And, you know, a stuff that makes you feel all of the things that, <laughs> that um, in, in many ways we consider human. So like these different experiences that are rather universal, these feelings of heartbreak, these feelings of, um, of infatuation, of, uh, you know, all of this stuff, like the way that these things kind of have like a visceral feeling um, when we read it, you know, or when we see it, if it's art, or when we hear it, if it's music, um, that really to me is, um, you know, it, it's such an, it's such a, an individual experience that we try to talk about, but it, and we really can't um, express it because it's so unique to each person. Um, and it's just that one, it, that one personal um, interaction between yourself and whatever it is that you're um, interacting with as art, you know? Yeah. And I think that uh, the, ch the challenge is on both sides as as a cons as a viewer a consumer of art and as a creator of art there's always this like you say this kind of co commercial 
thing that's that's playing in there, right? Whether you're a writer and you you know that your agent or the editor is going to want something that is consumable, you know, like f- on a mass level, or whether you're an, uh, a, a, a buyer, a consumer, of, a, a viewer, or an audience being influenced by the price tag, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the price, the price tag can be, you mentioned TikTok, the price tag could be the, the 2.5 million views that it already has that somehow tells you even before you watch it that it has greater value than the video that has, you know, 800 likes or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So how, how can we escape as, as creators and as an audience, how can we escape that price tag that like culturally, and, and you said the word gatekeepers, I think that's great. Like the culturally overwhelming price tag, right? This has value. This has value. This has value. This doesn't have value. This doesn't have value. Like, how do we, how do we escape that? How do we get audiences to not look at the price tag? Well, I don't know that we can do that. There's only so much that we can do from our, um, you know, that each person can do from within their own experience, I suppose, um, you know, uh, it's difficult because, you know, I think at the end of the day, so much of um, so much success as an artist is determined by how many people not only have interacted with your art, but also how many have like deemed it to be substantial or, you know, and as in some way, like bringing value to their lives, um, which, you know, is a lot to, to try to accomplish. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think in this way, I know this is maybe just a trite thing to say, but in this, in that way, I'm like just really thankful for the existence of libraries when it comes to um, this, especially I know Toronto um, has a really good library system where they have a lot of like stuff where, you know, you can, get stuff for free and therefore your experience of art and being able to be considered cultured or whatever um you can still have access to that um you know i i feel like if we were to have questions more about like you know what would art look like without outside of the constraints of capitalism i don't think we can really consider that at the moment just because um It just seems like, even though, you know, (laughs) the way that we live right now, we have not always lived like this. In in fact, we've actually lived like this um, for like a blip of of our human experiences. And then also a blip of like the the whole history of even just this planet. Um, uh, You know, we are a species that might, you know, by our own choices, kill ourselves. you know, is not the best, but also, you know, this is stuff that we have to really consider. Um, I think with the way that the planet is becoming more and more um, destroyed by by the very things that we're talking about, you know what I mean? Like by commerce, which is what is tied up in art. In, and then you think about, you know, the fact that these books have to be printed on all of this paper. And then, you know, all of this, you know, it, it just like, it all kind of is, gets all tangled. And so it, it's it. just a really big thing to have to unpack. But I think that, you know, um, stepping back into like the personal and the individual, I think that, you know, um, sometimes it's, it's the experience that we have with art is like, you know, something that at, at once can pull us out of ourselves and also help us be in touch with ourselves, um, which is really, really beautiful. And, um, you know, I don't know that you can put a a price tag on that, although we do (laughs) all the time. So um, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Well, I I think it's, I think I ask an almost impossible question because just like you, you said it, right? It's relative, right? And it's, it's impossible for one person to answer the question on behalf of an, an entire 
uh, commercial audience, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna lead into from there uh, this question as because you just mentioned it, the um, how a piece of art that you create affects an audience. Mind spread out on the ground has had wide reach and I feel has affected a lot of people and changed the minds of a lot of people and and um, it it's it's out there and it's it's uh, it's done well it's a fantastic book how how is it and I ask this question of a lot of writers because it, I'm always fascinated with you know as someone who hasn't published a book you know you publish that one book and you're like yay I freaking finally published a book right and then you have to sit down and do the work of publishing another book and you you've chosen to to create something in an entirely different genre which is in and of itself a, a challenge but how how is how does mind spread out on the ground and all of the essays that you've written so far how does that play into the creation of the novel do you do you even think about it um, well, I think that for me, it was a very deliberate decision after, um, after writing a mind spread on the ground to be like, okay, um, I just talked a lot about, um, things that are happening in the world that are, you know, um, that I try to be hopeful about, but still also kind of, um, bring a lot of anxiety and things like that. And also, um, you know, things in my own life that were difficult um, to deal with and continue to be difficult, you know. Um, and so for me, I was, I feel like it was very easy for me to just be like, enough nonfiction for now, let's go into fiction, which is where like, you know, um, not only can I create the character, but I can control kind of like the setting, what I, what I want to, I control everything about it. You know what I mean? Like you have kind of become like, a little bit of a of of the god of that world in in a weird way, um, and so I think that for me, being able to kind of be like, okay, I want to move into something different. I want to move into something that where I can talk about um, similar topics, uh, you know, but through the lens of a character that I'm creating and scenarios that I'm putting this character in with consequences that you know. Um, actually I was just talking to, um, Eden Robinson and she said basically like, but something that I think is so smart, which is just in terms of, um, writing that plot book, like the plot of books is just consequences. And so like, to me, I, you know, figuring out situations for me to put, um, my protagonist in and figuring out what those consequences are and where they lead and everything like that is, um, even though I know kind of where it's going, it still is surprising and um, in ways that I think are similar to what happened when I was writing my essays. I would never outline my essays. I would just kind of go um, wherever, you know, um, my instinct or intuition took me. And so I think from in that way, the, the writing experience is similar. But, um, you know, uh, writing something that's book length <laughs> instead of, you know, with essays, you can write like, you know, um, there's uh, there's different essay lengths in there. There's like one that's like five pages. There's some that are like 30 pages. And so, you know, um, but even then you're able to kind of like, those are all their own little encapsulated um, things. <laughs> and, and so writing something that's book length is just like so big, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I guess um, I'm just kind of trying to, have fun writing this in some ways, even though uh, the the t subject matter isn't necessarily always fun um, that I'm writing about, it's still something that at the end of the day, I can write whatever I want. And it doesn't, and um, it only really, you know, um, is dependent on my own imagination, I guess. Um, yeah. So that's fun for me, <laughs> as opposed to like, you know, having, focusing on what's happening in the world all the time, which like, you know, to be very, very overwhelming. You get this, um, or at least I would get this kind of feeling of helplessness, like eventually where it felt like 
what can I do to, to stop some of these things or what can I do to make people reconsider and, um, you know, all of this and, and that I'm not really worrying about too, too much as I'm writing. I'm just kind of like writing and, you know, yeah, seeing what happens. I feel like it, I, I feel like it's, um, I mean, this might be easy to say that it's inevitable what's happening in the world and in your life right now is going to find a place in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like I've done that with fiction, but, um, but you can do that, you know, you can address all of the, the anxieties and, and overwhelming shit that's happening in the world by, by putting your character there too, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems simplistic, but um, how much of, of what we did in workshop, what we learned in workshop, like structure and where to put the inciting incident and, and, you know, all the, all those things that you're told in workshop and then, and then told smartly to go out and break all the rules, right? Mm -hmm. How, how is it sitting down and writing the novel? Like you just said that you don't outline, but and another conversation you and I had, we talked about how writers just, you know, write a whole bunch of scenes, collect them all, and then try to find out where they're going to be in the novel. And for you, you've got this one super important spot in the novel that you're kind of yeah. writing toward. How, how has all that, you know, stuff that, that we've learned how is that playing into the direction you're taking towards that place in the novel? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that um, when I was back in doing like workshops back then, um, I didn't understand exactly, you know, um, the way that plotting works in terms of like having an inciting incident and then uh, you know rising action climax i understood that sorry i have to like move around <laughs> so my, my little hip is just not having fun today um, but um uh yeah <laughs> um but i i just i didn't understand it and um and why what I thought was interesting, which was, you know, very much, um, you know, stream of consciousness, interior, um, very close first person point of view. Um, I, I was very confused as to why that wasn't something that would was kind of valuable in and of itself. Um, and, you know, the fact that you know, but back then I was very much interested in, and I don't think it's that different now, but, um, you know, back then I was particularly interested in how, um, you know, these things that happen sometimes in a person's life, that things that change the way that they look at things, um, aren't always the result of, you know, um, an inciting incident and then a rising action and all of this stuff. Sometimes there's like, you know, these small things that happen that just kind of shift the way that we think. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily um, <laughs> uh, very plot heavy, <laughs> but you know, I still thought that that was like, to me, that was what was really interesting. Um, and I, I think that for me, I definitely have a, bit, a better understanding of plot as a result of, um, I, I talk about this a lot, but um, as a result of actually um, reading screenwriting books, um, because right. they're very, very, um, like they hammer it in. You know, you have to have your inciting incident by page 15. You have to have your, you know, this by the, uh, on this page, and <laughs> like that people will read, will open it up and look to that page and be like, what is it that happens here? And like, if it's not there, then they just fucking sh throw it <laughs> away. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and so for me, I, I kind of, I understand that and I understand the ways that that um, structure in a way it's all kind of conceived to play with or to not play with but in a sense manipulate your audience to feel certain things at certain times and um, you know I think 
in the time since we were in that class, um, now that I'm writing this book, I would say that probably, you know, um, if you were to look at it on a, like on a, a hero's journey chart, it wouldn't make any fucking sense. But also right. I think that um, in a way, you know, um, I really, for this book in particular, think um, looking to um, very specific writers as kind of like um, inspiration. And in this case, it's, um, I'm really looking at like Otessa Moshva, for example, and the way that she does, the, she really uses the narrative voice to drive forward the plots of both Eileen and um, my year of rest and relaxation, particularly my rest, my year of rest and relaxation is very much propelled forward just by the strength of the voice. There's really not a lot that happens. Um, separate books? Uh, yeah, they're two separate books. Um, and so, yeah, so um, my year of rest and relaxation does that really well. And so, you know, if you were to look at the plot, you'd be like, eh, not a lot happens, but um, like most of it is literally a woman who's, you know, taking a whole bunch of cocktail of pills to try and sleep for a year. Like that's literally the plot of the thing. So like not a lot happens there, but um, you know, I think that for me, what is, um, cause the, the character in the novel I'm writing right now is a new mother, someone who, you know, um, traditional society would say like, there's not very much that's interesting in, um, you know, being a young, uh, being a new mother, um, the, the ins and outs of that kind of experience is, um, boring because to other people like no one likes to talk about it um right. no one likes to make art about it um and I think that you know for me I think that there's something that's so inherently dramatic about that because it, there is this kind of um way that when you have a child and you're the mother who's taking care of that child and you have these like physical reactions um that you uh you just, it makes things so much more intense. And um, then like any kind of other experience at any other given time, like you're just the circumstances of it, you're sleep deprived. There's this kid that you'd have no fucking clue how to communicate. With. Like there's no communication other than screaming and you don't know oh. how to like, what what to do to get the screaming to stop. You're like, yeah. it. and so, you know, like these are things that I feel like are are actually inherently dramatic and a lot of women's experiences um, do have inherent drama in them, but you know, we're, we're considered, they aren't considered, you know, as interesting or um, because they are, they don't have this um, very, um, I would say kind of like masculine ideas of plot um, and, and like, in terms of like the hero's journey, that being masculine, you know what I mean? Like that's a guy who's going out to do these things like Hercules, I always kind of imagine. And, you know, when you see a woman after experience after experience. Yeah. And like when you, you're in with, when you're a woman who's dealing with something that's very interior, um, that doesn't mean that it's not worthy of art. That doesn't mean that it's not inherently dramatic. And so for me, I think that, you know, taking that and, looking putting pressure on that situation and what a woman thinks about and all of these things like that to me has enough drama and, and, and enough interest um especially if you know you figure out the right narrative voice it can propel a book forward in ways that you know um that might not be possible if you were to just focus on something like plot yeah yeah, no, I love, and you know, just thinking, it always makes me think when I, whenever I read a book, I start uh, and I, you know, get right into it. And always there's like this voice from workshop that forces me to ask, what, what perspective is this being told from? <laughs> and, yeah. And in writing first person, that character is so powerful and so strong. Why would one need a, a, an entire workshop to talk about first person? When yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like owned by the character, it's owned by the narrator. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up for questions. Kaylee, if you have any questions for Alicia, Kaylee is there. She's going to grab them and uh, and take them from you. And then uh, we're gonna raffle off. We've got a copy of Mind Spread out on the ground. 
and uh, a bunch of books from More Hype Publicity that have been donated and um, will be sent to you. Um, you, we, I don't want to get into the the poetry, even though uh, <laughs> every time I think about um, you writing poetry, I think about I can't not think about workshop and and the challenges in um, again back to the the first question about witness, right? Like in writing poetry, and and we've talked about this. It's one thing if you know the poetry is just for you, like you're you're just trying to put emotions and and words into some sort of form but it's completely another thing knowing that you're you're gonna submit it somewhere yeah right it's like yeah right. <laughs> I, I, I won't I don't want to take up any more time from uh, anyone else who has questions about that. <laughs> like it really does cause me a lot of anxiety when I think about it I feel like I should write poetry but I'm too afraid um yeah I get that because like I, I've written a bunch of poetry and like I just you know even going back to it I read all of it and I was just like I don't I don't I feel very much like my experience of poetry is similar to the way that I experienced songs when I was um, like in high school. And so <laughs> I don't know that I've necessarily created or developed this sophisticated palette um, that, you know, a uh, certain, you know, I, I feel like a lot of poets have because, you know, they've, they've read the classics, they've read um, people who are, you know, doing really complex and interesting things. But I'm just kind of like, but what does it make me feel? <laughs> yeah. So well, I don't, I, 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 I feel like in some ways the, the poetry that I have written and, and of late is um, very different in that way from um, uh, the, the essays that I've written and stuff like that, because it's all about just kind of like that experience of feeling and not as much as uh, about Although there's still other stuff, but I don't know. I just don't want to, I don't, I don't know. I guess it's weird to talk about it without, <laughs> without, without reading anything, but I just, um, I don't know. I do feel like some, even if I don't do anything with. I am happy for you to read poetry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I have asked you and it, I we know, I know. <laughs> give it into a, a different conversation. <laughs> Because I know, I, but uh, I just feel like, I don't know, even if I, if it's just for me for right now, or maybe forever that like, you know, it, it was like an outlet for me to get things, to do things. And also it gave me something to do. <laughs> yeah. when I, I'm amazed that, cause I know that that poetry should on some level be emotional. And I'm always, when I, whenever I read poetry, whether it's something I connect to emotionally or not, I'm always amazed at the, the, what the like what you had said uh, in talking about just putting reading something and, and reading it for the language I do that with poetry like I just I just want to see how poets put words together and and that's what amazes me like not that I take away any kind of emotional thing but that I read it and I go god look at those fucking words like they're just so great you know yeah but okay, so I will, Kaylee has a question. Yes. Do you want me? To <laughs> uh, yeah, we have um, a question first from Adam. And Adam asks, when you're working on a project, do you read materials that are similar in tone or subject matter as you're working on, or do you tend to avoid those materials? Okay, that is a good question. I, um, really do because I like to see how or really do um I should clarify I really do like to um read material that's similar um because I like to see how another author has approached this and see what I can like basically um get them to teach me uh, what either what to do or what not to do what I like and what I don't like about how they approach it so for this novel we didn't I didn't really get it like it's still the early stuff that I read. So it doesn't, I didn't get a chance to really get, get into this, but um, the character um, uh, is 
um, does develop um, postpartum psychosis. And so at a certain point in the novel, she's, um, you know, having these very intense um, periods of psychosis and, um, you know, uh, delusions and things like that. And I actually um, just bought a whole bunch of books um, and have been reading those um, uh, at the same time, kind of researching um, what people or how people have expressed that. And the interesting thing is that what I'm finding is um, so much of it is memoir and or, or you know, um, that I've seen is, is memoir. And so people um, kind of write about it in a very past tense situation, which um, is fascinating because I'm writing um, my novel in present tense um, quite deliberately. And so, you know, the uh, being able to talk about a, an experience in the past is very different than, you know, being able to write about the visceral experience of it in the present and all of the thoughts that go racing through your head and all of this stuff. And so I'm trying to like, kind of see like, so I'm finding it's, it's a bit difficult to find anyone doing exactly that, um, uh, that I can see like how they did it or how they accomplished it um, and made it accurate to kind of how my own experiences of psychosis have been. And um, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting challenge. Um, I'm also, <laughs> I also just think that, you know, for me, um, I already mentioned, uh, my year of rest and relaxation, but you know, um, there's these, like, I, I really do like books that are helmed by, or that are helmed by a very, very particular narrator who's, um, whose personality really drives the, the book. So, um, you know, I've, I've read that. I've, I've been reading and enjoying reading um, uh, Anna Connor Schofield, um, who, uh, you know, she writes these very, very like, um, these characters that are often like absolutely wild, um, but um, you know, they're, they're so strong in the characterization and um, you just like get carried away by their voice. And I think that that's something that I'm really fascinated in. So I'm like reading those kinds of novels um, to kind of like, you know, take the good stuff from them from there that I can steal and use that. <laughs> that's all steal. No, it's influence. <laughs> Um, Kaylee, are there any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, my next question is from Donna. And Donna asks, I know your novel is fiction, but what part of yourself are you looking to explore in the text? Um, okay, so what am I looking to explore in the text? <sighs> um, I think that there's I, I do think it's really fascinating the uh, the I guess um, expectation that's kind of put on authors who are writing novels. Um, you know, I, I I have already said that I, I I'm talking about um, you know my character is having um, psychosis and I've experienced psychosis myself. But, um, you know, the experiences are totally different. And so I think for me, what is actually helpful is to not um, actually explore it through myself because I've already done that in, um, in a mind spread out on the ground. And I just feel like um, through for this, the, the what is appealing to me um, in terms of a novel as opposed to a nonfiction book is that I have that screen of having a, a fictional character to work with. And so, you know, I can, um, I can ask questions of the, what the character would say or whatever, which, you know, I may agree with, <laughs> with some of the things, um, but also I have to be very aware that I'm, you know, um, that when you're telling a, a story about a character, it's about the character at the end of the day. Um, and you, if you want to create a realistic character, then, you know, you're going to ideally make it so that people think that this is like almost like their own total person that they could just, you know, message and be like, what do you think of this? Or whatever. <laughs> instead of, um, instead of being like, oh, this is totally Alicia. And therefore, 
you know, what does Alicia think? And that's what the character thinks. Um, um, so for me, I think uh, the experience of writing a novel isn't really about, um, at the, the moment anyways, uh, not about me exploring parts of myself. It's more about exploring, um, exploring things about the world that I want to interrogate through the lens of a fictional character and a series of circumstances that I put that character through. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not really, I wouldn't say I'm really interrogating too much about myself in that way. Um, but really looking at the world through a character that I've kind of created um, that may have some similarities to things that I've experienced because like that's, you know, we, we all come from our own <laughs> set of ex circumstances and experiences. Yeah. But, you know, um, yeah, I'm not that interested in like bringing it back to me, I guess, in the novel. I, I think that's super important. And I feel, I feel like um, just in the marketing of the novel, when, when it comes to it, I think that, you know, when we're, again, we're talking about the audience and the, the expectations of the audience, right? I, I feel like the, the marketing of the novel is going to have to very clearly um, present the narrator as the, the character net slash narrator as like, this is fiction, right? Because yeah. I feel and we've talked about this so many times, how people have a really difficult time, especially if a novel's written in first person, they have a really difficult time separating the author from the experiences that the character is having. Mm -hmm. that, that's what, um, yeah. Anyway, I won't go. So there's one more question um, and, then, and then we're not gonna take any more questions and I'm going to raffle off uh, a copy of mine spread out on the ground and some other books. Alicia, are you okay with another question? Yeah, yeah. All right, our last question comes from Pamela. And Pamela asks, has the business of being a writer impacted or informed your process with your newer work? Mm. Um, I think that for me, I'm mostly focused at this moment on things that are exciting to me in terms of um, writing. So you know, um, thinking about, you know, writing a book where an Indigenous woman who has never been to university, who married in this white guy and, and ended up, you know, doing okay, but, you know, she has her own things that she wants to do that she's feeling very unfulfilled about. Um, also, you know, eventually experiencing psychosis and having to deal with, you know, the ramifications and fallouts of that while, you know, reflecting on all of these things that are happening in her life and how they're kind of coming to a head. Um, I think that that is something that, you know, interests me particularly because there's not really, I don't think a lot of um, writing about um, in particular psychosis um, from a perspective that's not just a white person. Um, and so I think that, you know, for me, talking about that and then also you know being able to kind of um talk about the ways that delusions work and um the ways that you know these the ways that the country of Canada kind of operates on indigenous women um particularly indigenous mothers um uh, it, it creates this kind of like a feeling, these feelings of paranoia that, you know, would be another, other people who, who don't have that experience would um, maybe be like, oh, this is like terrible or whatever, but this is like their reality. And so kind of taking those and pulling those into delusions to kind of um, make it so that, you know, um, this is something that is both not real and real. Um, like that's kind of the thing that I'm, I'm kind of interested in doing. And I, I think that for me, um, I think every writer wants, I think uh, their, their writing to do well in terms of whatever that, um, that means um, financially or in terms of accolades or awards. Um, 
it's really hard to get away from that, um, to be honest, especially when you have um, like, you know, family who's relying on you um, for, you know, um, for money, <laughs> life. Um, but I think that, you know, I'm not too concerned about what, how this book is going to sell. I'm really more concerned about, and this is kind of where I come from in general. Like this is where I was with A Mind Spread on the Ground as well. Um, I was more concerned with um, what I would kind of term as like um, my ideal readers who are people, uh, when I say that it's not necessarily, it, the, the word ideal kind of throws it off, but um, it's just, for me, the people who I want my book to resonate with most, the people who I want to um, feel at home in the work and not feel alienated from it. And so, you know, realistically, you can't write a book that's going to um, hold everyone in that way. And so for me, I'm very concerned about, um, you know, for my last book, it was, um, I wanted Indigenous women and um, Two-Spirit and queer people to feel really centered in the book. Um, for this one, I want specifically, not just all Indigenous women, I want specifically Haudenosaunee women to feel um, like that. So I'm, I'm you know, con concerned more about my specific community, um, uh, particularly in regards to how I'm holding and carrying certain stories. Um, and I also am very concerned about um, the experiences of uh, people who have experienced psychosis. And um, so like those are the two kind of groups that for me are the most important. And I feel like if I write something that, you know, they can read and be like, okay, I feel like this is something that was written for and to me, then, um, you know, then other people are going to have the impression of it that is best for those communities. And then they, if it does go on to sell well, then that means that I'm not doing harm with my art which is, you know, something that I think more people should consider, <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, that's, a, it's just everyone's individual perspective, I guess, um, and different people are going to have different opinions. <laughs> yeah, likely, but so for you, you're, the business of writing is more about fulfilling that mandate of, of creating a piece of art for, for those people you love, as opposed to winning awards and making money and, and doing all that other side of the business of writing. Yeah, like that's definitely the the thing that I'm most concerned about with this project in particular. I think that, you know, um, maybe down the line, if I want to make more money, I will, um, I will consider other alternatives because I feel like, um, you know, writing nonfiction books and writing, you know, literary fiction isn't necessarily the money maker. <laughs> that you know it maybe once was but um particularly if you're someone if you're not like basically margaret atwood like you're not making that that money so. yeah, exactly you need to start writing uh thrillers or the um hallmark movies that i am for whatever fucking reason fascinated by and consume on a obscene level um but whatever Anyway, Alicia, I am so grateful for you uh, joining us here today. I'm grateful for you on so many levels for having you in my life and teaching me so much, uh, making me a better person because I do have my limits. Um, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to raffle off. Uh, there's some stiff competition because uh, we, we got a lot of people registered into this event. So the first, I'm going to raffle off the um, book pack from Moore Hype Publicity, uh, which is great. Nathaniel uh, Moore has been very generous with uh, giving us some books to, to raffle off. So uh, in this package, you are going to get Belated Briss of the Brain Sick, uh, a collection of poems from Lucas Crawford. You're going to get a copy of Bowl Brawl, which is a very funny uh, bowling slash fighting book from Nathaniel Moore. Um, I, you, I, I, I feel like I, uh, I, I haven't read it. I've just read everything about it, but notice <laughs> from Dustin Cole in the beggarly style of imitation, a unique collection from Jean-Marc Asen. Um, Kaylee, would you like to raffle off that collection first? 
Yes, yeah, so our first one, we've got a bundle of four. The winner for that one is Adam Pottle. Yay! Adam <laughs> yes, Adam, can you send me an email to junctionrights at gmail.com and I will um, put you in touch with, are you, are you there, Adam? I thought, he, I thought for a second you were going to come on video. Um, just send me an email and I will uh, put you in touch with Nathaniel and he'll have those books sent out to you. And um, I just want to, hi, Adam. <laughs> um, I want to say, because it came into my head when we were talking about the kind of books that would, would sell. I have always dreamed of you writing some kind of murder mystery in the wrestling world. <laughs> Oh my God, it's so funny that you say that because actually, I, I won't say anything more. <laughs> Is it funny? Um, you thought, see, now I, I can't. I take kind of, okay, I kind of want to write a script about that. <laughs> I think it would sell. I think it would sell. Um, okay, now we're going to raffle off a copy of A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, uh, which has been donated by publicity at Penguin Random House. All right, our winner for um, that one is Rachel Upton. Rachel, are you still here? Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate uh, being able to sit down and talk to you. I uh, feel so happy that uh, you got to share or that you decided to share an extract <laughs> from with us. Um, it is captivating and I honestly can't wait to uh, read, it, read it in its entirety. Thank you everyone for coming today uh, and supporting Alicia and this uh, new endeavor that uh, she is on. And that's it. Come back next week, March 7th. We will have Aparna Kaji Shah. She is here, Aparna. Hello, uh, and she's going to share a scent of Mogra and other stories with us, and I hope you will join us. Thanks, Alicia. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>